Hi, I'm Jennifer Isabella, your host for Forrester's podcast, What It Means, where we explore the latest market dynamics impacting executives and their customers. Today, we're joined by principal analyst Gina Bawalker to discuss the value of responsible design. Welcome, Gina. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. So let's start with the basics. What is responsible design and how do we define it at Forrester? So the way we define this at Forrester is responsible design is creating experiences that provide consistently positive outcomes and avoid harm for all stakeholders. You can really think about it as an approach that helps a business do two different things. One is to make sure that the products, services, experiences that you are putting out there are actually having a positive impact on customers by applying decision-making tools throughout your company's design process that make sure those products are created in accordance with ethical principles, things like safety and privacy, fairness and transparency, all very important things. The other thing it helps a business do is anticipate and mitigate potential harms that your experiences could cause. And that includes harms that you never intended, right? Um, Unintended consequences, enabling bad actors to create harm on individuals or even society as a whole using your product. So really that's what it boils down to. We wanna create products that adhere to ethical principles. We want to anticipate and mitigate potential harms. And this is a methodology that enables you to do that. Now, I I will just add, Jen, that it's important that organizations take that general definition of responsible design and expand on it and really define what it means for them based on the context in which they're operating. Um, Just to give a quick example, every organization should prioritize certain ethical principles when designing, like privacy, like accessibility, because there are regulations that require that they do so in many regions of the world. But then, you know, you think of other things like um, uh, ethical principles like inclusion. That's very important for any organization that has publicly said we're committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion maybe less important for different organizations. And then there's industry kind of specific lenses to the definition as well. For example, if you are a bank and you are using AI to make decisions about who is approved for financial products, you better be prioritizing ethical principles like explainability um, to make sure that you're not denying applicants based on factors like race. You know, being able to explain how those models work is particularly important. That may be less important for a media company who's personalizing content on your social media feed and doesn't feel that they need to explain the ins and outs of how that personalization is is happening. So again, we encourage organizations to take the definition of responsible design and really say, what does that look like? How does that manifest in our organization? How should we think about this? This is like an evolution of the design process. Is this something completely net new? I would think of it more as an evolution. So I will tell you that most businesses that I work with um, at Forrester are not practicing responsible design today, Um, or they may have really good intentions. They might say, of course, we want to make sure that we're creating experiences that adhere to ethical principles, but they don't really understand how to do that. They haven't embedded the right kind of gates, the right checkpoints, the right activities in, in their process. So it does require an evolution of your design methodology, but it's important to recognize this isn't about working more, it's about working differently. The phrase that we heard over and over again when doing this research was, responsible design is about asking the right questions at the right time. And I love that because that feels so manageable. We're not telling you you need to go buy a new piece of technology or hire you know, a completely new team of experts within your company to practice responsible design. You need to get really good at asking more questions about the products, services, and experiences that you're putting out into the world. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. And then you know, there's specific methods that help organizations do that. So can you unpack a little bit, like what are the benefits of taking that extra step or evolving the design process? What are those benefits of responsible design? 
There's many benefits. I mean, the business case here is very strong. I would say the most important one I want organizations to understand is that this helps you build a trusted business. We we put that in the title of the research for a reason. Um, this is a great strategy to earn trust, both with your customers and employees. And the reason that's the case is um, it helps firms operationalize what Forrester calls the levers of trust. You know, we have done the research to understand what are the important levers that you need to prioritize um, to to earn the trust of your customers and employees. So for example, we know that empathy is a key lever of trust. Responsible design requires the organization to put principles like inclusion and and accessibility at the center of how they're making decisions. And that makes sure that their products are not harming you know, specific populations. Um, and then instead they're creating experiences that show that they really understand different populations of customers, including marginalized populations like people with disabilities. So what a great demonstration demonstration of empathy and a way to, again, demonstrate that lever of trust. So I would say that's the one that is probably the, the biggest benefit that companies stand to gain is earning trust. And Trust can feel squishy, though. Obviously, it's a huge benefit, as you just noted. So why why really should business leaders care about that trust piece? Trust is important because our research at Forrester has shown that it drives revenue generating behaviors. When consumers trust you, they are more likely to purchase from you again. They are more likely to prefer your company over competitors, to try new products and services from you, to share personal data with you. Put another way, if your customers trust you, you have greater growth potential as a brand. You know, and what executive doesn't want that? So uh, there's kind of a clear, clear case to be made for why trust matters. It also really matters when it comes to your employees. We know that when employees trust the company that they're working for, they are more likely to be productive. They're more likely to be effective at their jobs. And We also know, by the way, that when there are breaches of trust, that that will significantly hurt a business. Um, We know from our research, for example, that many consumers will actually stop doing business with a company altogether if they see a company doing something that appears to contradict the values that it stands for, um, essentially resulting in them not trusting that brand anymore. So while it's really squishy, um, our trust imperative research, which I encourage listeners to go read if you haven't already, makes a really compelling case for both what trust is and why it matters so much, both in a customer experience and employee experience context. And I imagine, certainly, if you're one of the few organizations sort of implementing responsible design, that can be a key differentiator for you compared to your competition, right? It it absolutely can. I mean, in several different ways. You know, one way is responsible design is a a really effective approach to deliver on your company's values. Mm -hmm. And consumers are smart. You know, when consumers see a company doing something that acts not in accordance with their values, um, they don't like that, right? And and that they will stop wanting to do business with a firm as a result of that. So this can be a way to differentiate and say, look, like we are a company that stands for these things. You know, we're all about honesty. We're all about inclusion. We're all about privacy, you know, whatever those values are. Um, and by the way, you can see evidence that we're actually reflecting those in our products and services. And that's really important. Um, you know, just differentiating by showing that you are someone that reinforces those values um, and, you know, is, is living them out, not just talking a really nice talk, so to speak, if you will. The other thing is there's an innovation opportunity here. Um, you know, this is a way for customers to innovate better and ultimately drive differentiation, boost market share. Um, one of the examples I'm giving clients lately is, you know, there's a lot of hyper adoption of generative AI happening right now. You know, every organization is working very quickly to say, what is our strategy related to Gen AI? And that's all great, but the organizations that are going to be successful in the long run are the ones who yes, act quickly, but also take that measured approach and make sure that they're 
asking questions about those experiences that they are putting out into the market using generative AI to ensure that, you know, they're not going to result in um, reinforcing biases, you know, around, about specific populations of customers or leading to discrimination against customers. So responsible design is becoming even more urgent um, on the one hand and also an even bigger opportunity on the other hand for businesses as we are seeing rapid advances in technologies right now like gen ai yeah i sort of i feel like you just hinted at some of the risks of ignoring <laughs> responsible design so let's just go there i mean what what are the <laughs> it's risks? hard for me not to jump to the risks <laughs> yeah. cuz they're so compelling yes totally but let's dive in yeah so absolutely i mean several risks of organizations that don't make responsible design part part of their approach um one, you know, we just talked about a bit, which is putting products out that reinforce biases that lead to discrimination, that can lead to a PR nightmare as a result of doing those things. And, you know, we've seen real examples of that. There was a Stanford study earlier this year about the inequitable audit practices at the IRS. Um, you know, they found that the IRS was disproportionately auditing black taxpayers, and it was related to how the audit selection algorithm was designed. And I think this is a classic example of if people were asking more questions when that algorithm was created, testing it in more ways, perhaps you know that result would not have, have happened. So that's one example of a risk. Another one is it's, it's hard these days to attract and retain the best talent. And we see that firms struggle um, when they have missteps here. So for example, um, the Cambridge Analytica scandal that happened Meta struggled to hire talent after that scandal. Um, they saw a significant decrease in acceptance rates for you know, new graduate uh, roles that were offered, engineering roles. And this is not super surprising. I mean, we know that candidates entering the workforce now are starting to ask tougher questions of the companies that they're considering giving a lot of their time to. Um, they're going to think twice about working for a company that violates ethical principles that they hold as important to them as individuals. So any organization that is seeking to attract and retain the best talent, particularly generations entering the workforce right now, um, it is to their benefit to design responsibly. And then there's two kind of final risks that I'll throw out there for consideration. And one is, you know, this can result in inadvertently providing tools that others can use to exploit vulnerable populations, and it can lead to regulatory and legal action against your firm. And the best way to elaborate on what I mean by both of those is actually with an example. So Epic, which is a game design company, they're the creators of Fortnite, which I never played myself, but I understand from those that did. It was a wildly popular game, I believe still is. But people don't really know the dark side to the story behind that game, which is they were actually fined $275 million by the FTC because they failed to adequately protect children from harassment. Um, and this has to do with the way that their settings were designed. So they designed their default privacy settings to enable live on by default text and voice communication. And that led to children getting bullied while playing the game. So these are, you know, design choices, like specific UI design choices that if someone had been there saying, okay, have we made sure that we are adhering to our ethical principles around privacy that we say are very important? Um, this wouldn't have happened. By the way, they also had to pay $245 million in refunds to their customers because they used coercive design patterns to trick children into making in-app purchases that they didn't have parental consent for. So many different kind of ethical violations at play there, but I think illustrates just the severe consequences a business can face by not practicing responsible design. Um, and I'll just share one last thing with that example, because I think this is really important. It actually came out that employees at Epic had tried to raise red flags and say, we need to rethink how we are designing these privacy settings for this game. But the company didn't listen, launched the product as it was. And that just really underscores the importance of not just like tactically putting steps in place to 
practice responsible design, but creating a culture where employees feel enabled and empowered to speak up when they see violations of you know, ethical principles um, in the experiences that the company is creating. So I just wanted to, to underscore that point as well. Well, Gina, I'm curious, you know, we actually just spoke to Enza, who, you know, leads a lot of our privacy research as it relates to generative AI and privacy. But she brought up the point that a lot of ethics teams are um, being reduced at some of the these large tech firms. I mean, how, you know, from a culture perspective and sort of training and just making sure that there is that culture, as you described, like, Who's responsible for that? How does that get embedded into an organization so, you know, people aren't bumping into a wall trying to raise issues like like what's happening, you know, at Epic? How does that how should we think about that? You're hitting on one of the biggest challenges that we heard in this research to why organizations don't have repeatable practices in place for responsible design. Um, one of my favorite quotes was uh, someone we spoke with talking about fragmented approaches to ethics. And they were referring to the fact that you probably have people in the organization thinking about ethics in the context of AI. Um, you probably have passionate designers who want to do the right thing and are, are you know, it's making their best effort in the areas they can control. But if you don't have a centralized um, function and a centralized framework for, you know, what uh, what does responsible design mean for us? What are those priority ethical principles that we are going to hold ourselves accountable to? Then you're not going to have a lot of success here. So it really starts with leadership saying this is a priority. Um, we don't just say we're serious about these things because they align to our values, but we are going to do the work to put the right you know, governance in place, the right policies in place to ensure that we are embedding ethics into how we operate as an organization and in the context of this research into how we design experiences that are used by our customers and by our employees. So it absolutely starts there. Um, and we do see some companies that, you know, have office of ethics that have chief, chief trust officers. I mean, these are obviously really good places um, where ownership of, of this work can, can sit. Um, but I've also seen cases where the uh, VP of design at the organization is spearheading this work because, you know, they realize that the choices we make when we're designing that has, you know, such important ripple effects. And so, you know, they're creating kind of coalitions within their companies to start the conversation and begin to establish the uh, processes needed to really operationalize this work. Sort of leads me into the next obvious question, like, how do you get started with responsible design, right? How does how does this get baked into your approach? So the first step is to decide what responsible design means at your organization. And in the research, we actually lay out a five-step process to align on the ethical principles that your company needs to codify in your design process. So that's where you need to start. There's different approaches to, to doing that. Um, one of the favorite ones I heard is a tech organization that actually surveyed their employees and asked them, what is most important to, to you? You know, what are your personal ethics? And they use that input to ultimately align around five particular ethical principles that they infused into every aspect of their business. So you can take that approach. We, we offer some other approaches in the research as well. From there, once you've aligned on those principles, then a really great next step is to identify and prioritize high-risk journeys. Um, one example might be journeys where AI is going to play a critical role in delivering that experience. Um, we know that the stakes are high. We know the risk for harm can accelerate when you have algorithms making decisions and, and not humans, although ultimately humans are, are behind those. Um, and so identify key journeys like that and begin to audit those journeys, um, identify, you know, what are potential harms uh, that we could create, you know, by launching this experience. Um, one of my favorite techniques there is like the bad headlines workshop technique. What's the worst possible headline we could 
imagine, um, you know, that this product could could result in. That's a great way to start to uncover unintended consequences and potential harms. And then from there, you know, as a team, you can start to plan for how are we going to eliminate or at least mitigate those those areas that we uncover. So that's where I, that's where I would start, really defining, you know, those high priority ethical principles. What does responsible look design look like for your organization? And then beginning to apply those to a key set of high priority journeys that you're currently working on. Well, thanks so much, Gina, for joining me today and kind of probably scratching the surface on the importance of responsible design. I know you you dive in a little bit deeper with um, colleagues on the CX Cast um, episode, but thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Want a deeper dive into pressing customer experience topics? Want to strengthen your CX strategy, culture, and operations? Check out the CX Cast by Forrester. New episodes drop weekly, hosted by VP and Research Director Martin Gill and Senior Analyst Angelina Jenis. Check it out at 4.com slash CXCast. That's F-O-R-R dot com slash CXCast. Thanks for listening.